In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Greetings to all on this 23rd day of June. In the last segment of the program, Learning to Live in the Divine Will, I addressed the hours of the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and addressed in part their effects. The Hours of the Passion is a popular title for the book Luisa Picaretta wrote, entitled The Twenty-Four Hours of the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, which was dictated to her by Jesus himself. A servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, received many revelations on the Passion of Christ. But this book in particular that contains the depictions of his 24-hour Passion reveals, unlike any other, work on his Passion, the interior sorrows he endured. So this book helps us to understand more intimately, and in so doing, make reparation to Jesus, the internal sorrows that humanity imposed upon him through, in particular, their deliberate sinful actions. If Jesus' humanity lived, now when I say Jesus' humanity, I'm referring to his human nature. Jesus was God and man. He had two natures, divine and human. The divine was eternal, the human was in time, began 2,000 years ago, but is infinite, meaning it has no end. And this humanity of Jesus that enabled us human beings to participate in his divine nature lived in the Father's eternal will. Jesus' humanity lived in the Father's eternal will. Why? Because Jesus, while being God and therefore possessing all things from eternity, was, until his incarnation took place 2,000 years ago, not able. Think of that. Jesus was not able, or rather, the Son of God the second person of the Trinity, before he became incarnate and took upon him the name of Jesus, was not able to redeem mankind from its slavery to sin. It was only after the incarnation that G the second person of the Trinity took upon the name Jesus and a human nature which enabled him to redeem mankind from its slavery to sin, and begin the work of restoring mankind, human nature, to the primordial holiness and beauty and innocence that it enjoyed before sin. Now, what enslaved humanity to sin? What enslaved mankind to sin? Satan. How did he do it? In the book of Genesis, we find the answer. Satan seduced Eve, who in turn seduced Adam, both of whom in turn sinned against God's decree not to partake of the forbidden fruit. Now this forbidden fruit, according to the writings of the mystics, in particular Luisa Picaretta, had nothing to do with the body. It was purely an act of the will. The body was engaged in as much as it partook of this literal fruit of the tree of the many trees of the Garden of Eden, one of which only God had forbade them to partake of. And because they disobeyed this decree of God, knowing full well the consequences of their disobedience before they disobeyed, Mankind was infected with sin. The spiritual and physical DNA of the human race was altered, 
from original sin. In other words, all future human beings after Adam and Eve would now be conceived in sin due to no fault of their own, due to no personal fault of that child. It is an inherited component and the result of the first parents of the human race. So, the humanity that Jesus embraced when he became incarnate lived in the Father's eternal will in order to redeem the entire human race. When I say entire, I'm referring to all generations, not just the generation during the lifetime of Christ. How could Jesus' humanity live in the Father's eternal will and <coughs> redeem generations before and after him? His humanity was limited, was it not, to one place in time? Well, Jesus' humanity includes not just the body, but also the created human soul. That's right, created. Jesus' humanity was created. His divinity was not. In the womb of Mary, he took upon himself a humanity with both the spiritual and physical dimensions, which include an intellect, that's the part of the soul, a memory, and a will. These three faculties of the human created soul, Jesus began to embrace at the moment of his divine conception in the womb of Mary. And his body, the principal faculties, Louisa mentions, are the heart, the breath, and the blood, along with the other faculties, the senses, the five senses, and so forth, were engaged in the exercise of the soul's intellect, memory, and will. So the soul, so to speak, acted like a rudder, and the body like a boat, like the vessel. The soul guided the boat. The rudder guides the boat like Jesus' soul guided his body. So when I say Jesus' humanity lived in the eternal Father's eternal will and embraced the acts of all humans, this is what I'm referring to in that one sentence. His soul, his created human soul, his created human body that began to exist 2,000 years ago but are infinite, meaning they never end, they will exist for all eternity, lived in the Father's will and in so doing embraced all human acts. How did Jesus' humanity embrace all human acts? his intellect, his will, and his memory, these three faculties of his created human soul, are, were, and are not bound by time or space, as is the body. The soul of Jesus was able to embrace all thoughts, all intentions of all souls, all humans, all desires, good and bad, making reparation for the bad and glorifying the Father for the good. And in this way he redeemed the human race. Now, Jesus' humanity, from the moment of his divine conception in the womb of the Virgin Mary, to his death on the cross, was ordered to the crucifixion. Jesus knew this from the very beginning. Remember, the intellect is distinct from the brain. The brain is an organ of the body. The intellect is a faculty of the soul. The intellect precedes the brain. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in the womb of Mary, Jesus' intellect was fully coherent from the moment of his divine conception, even before the embryo in the womb of Mary was formed. Even before Jesus became an embryo, his intellect was at work. Same thing happens with all other humans. Of course, we don't have the same clarity of thought 
or foresight while in the womb as Jesus did or as Mary did because we, unlike Jesus and Mary, are conceived in sin. And sin impairs the functionality of the intellect, the memory, and the will. Now this does not mean that God is unfair by putting us in the womb of our mother in sin due to no fault of our own. Why? Because God is not only merciful but just, meaning if he allows us to be born with an original sin or stain on our soul due to no fault of our own, but to that of Adam and Eve, he also gives us the grace to grow progressively in understanding, in knowledge, in particular in the understanding and the knowledge of his holy will so that we can do it when we understand it. So God is patient and merciful and he does not hold us conceived in sin due to no fault of our own to the same standard as he, as he held Mary and Jesus who knew no sin. This is what just means. God is the great leveler of justice and mercy. He knows the propensity and dispositions of every individual, and no two individuals are the same. And he has standards that vary among them, you see, according to their propensity, their disposition, their ignorance, their knowledge, and so forth. Only God could repair sin, and that is why Jesus became man. If Jesus did not become man, there could be no redemption from sin. Mary could not do that. The Blessed Virgin Mary could not redeem mankind from sin. Why? Because sin is an infinite offense against an infinite God. No human being can repair an infinite sin because they're finite. All humans are finite. Only an infinite being, which is God, could repair an infinite offense. So when Adam committed a sin against God, his sin was irreparable in the sense that he himself, Adam, could not repair it. Only God could do that. If an eternal being is offended eternally, well, no finite being can make that eternal reparation. Only an eternal being can do that. So Jesus became man to not only free us from our slavery to sin, but to bring us back. Well, and when I say back, I don't mean we're going backwards, which some people mistakenly assert. We never go backwards in the Christian life. We always go forwards, and I will explain that. Bring us back to that primordial state of holiness and beauty. Now, when I say we never go back in the Christian life, I'm not saying that we don't repent of our sins. I'm not saying we don't go to confession and redo things that we should not have done. What I'm saying is that when we repent, when we redo the things that we should not have done, we are actually going forward in the process of redoing and repenting. Because God gives us always new and fresh graces with each passing moment. So if I committed a horrendous crime, or many horrendous crimes, and I wish to redo them, or undo them, or go back in the past and wish they would never occurred, or if I had the power, make them not exist, what I do is, one, I repent in my heart with contrition. Contrition is the source of forgiveness. Not lip service, but true heartfelt contrition. One. Two, present myself to the sacrament of confession and express that contrition to a priest. Three, after having been contrite and confessed sacramentally my sins, I thank God with gratitude for his forgiveness toward me and four, I am grateful and forgiving to others. See, this progress is always moving forward. It's not going backwards. 
It's moving forwards. Well, this is how Jesus redeemed the human race from its slavery to Satan and sin. He was born in the womb of Mary and went forward from that moment on, repairing on behalf of all mankind the sins that were, are being, and will ever be committed for all time. Jesus' soul, which is not bound by one human generation, was able to impact all human generations by speed of thought. His intellect, his memory, and also his will were the motive force behind his work of redemption. And these thoughts, recollections, and actions through the intellect, memory, and will that he engaged were embodied through his physical actions of sweeping, speaking, walking, etc., thereby producing a psychosomatic work of redemption, psycho meaning mind and soma meaning body, coalesced to form the work of redemption in Jesus' humanity. Now, Jesus, I mentioned, from the moment of his divine conception to the moment of his death on the cross, his humanity was ordered to the cross because the purpose of Jesus' incarnation was what? It was primarily the work of Savior, not Master, not Lord, not Teacher, Savior. Savior means he came to save us from sin and Satan. This was his primary work. All the other works were secondary. This means Jesus' primary purpose was redemption. He was to redeem mankind from its slavery to sin and Satan. And this is what he did from the moment of his conception to the moment of his death. And, let's not forget, the work did not end with his death. The sending of the Holy Spirit. That's where it became confirmed and culminated. So Jesus, after his death, ascended into heaven, right? And then came the descent of the gifts of the Spirit that he sent. All right. So once Jesus' work of redemption was complete, now the Holy Spirit's turn begins. His turn, his role, his function. The Holy Spirit's role or function is that of elevating, not redeeming, that work is done, elevating the human race to the same state of glory that it enjoyed before sin, or rather, surpassing mankind's original primordial beauty before sin. So the Holy Spirit does not return us, bring us backwards. He brings us forwards, you see. Jesus tells Luisa Picaretta that... Rightly so does the church speak of happy fault. What is happy fault? This expression was created by a 4th century theologian named St. Augustine. In Latin he calls it felix culpa, happy fault. Here Jesus tells Louisa that when he came to earth, he did not do so to simply free us from sin and make us victors over it, but to begin the work that the Holy Spirit would perpetuate of restoring to our human nature the same glory that Adam and Eve before sin and surpassing it. Here Jesus tells Louisa on February 26, 1922 from volume 14 the following. My redemption ransomed souls from sin. To their wounds and deformities I attached the diamonds, the pearls, and the jewels of my pains, in order to hide all of their evils and clothe them with such magnificence as to surpass their original state. Let me repeat that. I attach the diamonds, the pearls, the jewels of my pains in order to hide all of their evils, mankind's evils, and clothe them with such magnificence as to surpass their original state. Therefore, it is with reason that the Church says, Felix culpa, 
because with sin came redemption. And my humanity not only nourished mankind with its blood, but clothed it with its own person and adorned it with its own beauty. So here Jesus reveals to Louisa that his humanity, his body and his soul, his created soul and its faculties, and his created body and its faculties, worked together in a symbiotic effort to, to redeem all human generations from Satan and sin in order to begin the work of restoring mankind, body and soul, to the, not just to the original beauty he and she, Adam and Eve, enjoyed before sin, but to surpass that state of glory, innocence, and bliss. Hence the expression felix culpa, which in Latin means happy fault. Now why does Jesus refer to this expression in Latin when he speaks to Louisa in Italian, felix culpa? One, because these words came from Augustine, who wrote in Latin. And two, because at the time of Louisa, all liturgies were celebrated only in Latin. So all the masses in Italy were said in Latin. In Spain were in Latin. In America were in Latin. So Latin was the universal language of the Church. And by the way, it still is today, inasmuch as all documents that come from the Church, before they're translated into the respective language, the vernacular, are written in Latin. All documents of the Church first begin in Latin. All texts, too, liturgical texts for the Mass, for the Bible, they all start in Latin. Except, of course, for the Old Testament, which was originally in Hebrew, and maybe the book of the Hebrews, which was in Hebrew in the New Testament, or the Greek books, you know, Apart from their original manuscripts, all works are, that come from the church are in Latin. All right. Now, Jesus, when he came to set us free from Satan and sin, he did so how? By means of the cross. Okay? Now, the cross I touched upon in the last segment when I addressed the work, the 24 hours of the passion of our Lord and Jesus Christ which addresses Jesus' humanity that lived in the Father's eternal will and embraced the acts of all humans. Jesus tells Louisa that the soul, the human being, that reads these hours of the Passion dictated to her by Jesus himself will do exactly what Jesus did when he was on earth. Consider the following passage taken from Volume 11, October 1914. There is no date, just a month, to this excerpt, because Louisa forgot some dates. She simply wrote October 1914 for the following. Here Jesus tells Louisa, These hours are the most precious of all because they are the reenactment of what I did in the course of my mortal life and what I continue to do in the most blessed sacrament. When I hear these hours of my passion, I hear my own voice and my own prayers. In the soul I behold my will, that is, my will desiring the good of all and making reparation for all. Whence I feel drawn to dwell in this soul, to be able to do within it what the soul itself does. Oh, with what love I desire that at least one soul in each town meditate upon these hours of my passion. I would hear my own voice in each town, and my justice, greatly indignant in these times, would be placated in part. Unquote. As the soul assimilates itself with Jesus' passion by reading and meditating on these hours of the passion that are on the website, by the way, for your availability, the website, which is livinginthedivinewill.org, ltdw.org, 
As the soul assimilates itself with Jesus' passion by meditating on this work, it progressively embraces, like Jesus, the acts of all creatures of all centuries. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 14, October 19th, 1922, All of this happens for the soul who lives in the center of my will. This soul embraces everyone, and no one escapes it. It acts on behalf of everyone, and omits no one. Together with me, this soul diffuses itself to the right and to the left. It precedes and it follows everyone's acts, but in a simple and natural way. And as it operates in my will, the soul does the round of all centuries and raises its act above all human acts in a divine manner by virtue of my will. Unquote. By meditating on these hours of the passion, the soul's assimilation of its thoughts, words, desires, with the thoughts, words, and desires of all humans of all centuries, is an assimilation, engendering a sort of fusion with Jesus' humanity, who restores to creation its primordial holiness and divine harmony. Consider the following excerpt taken from volume 12, May 16th, 1920, I'm sorry, 1917. These hours are the order of the universe. They put heaven and earth in harmony and restrain me from sending the world to ruin. I feel my blood, my wounds, my love, and all that I did circulating and flowing throughout all to save all. As souls do these hours of the passion, I feel my blood, my wounds, my anxieties to save souls ignited, and I feel my own life being repeated. How could souls obtain any benefit if not by means of these hours? Why do you doubt? This is not your work but mine. What? You are but the tempered and weak instrument." Unquote. <clears throat> so here the soul, by meditating piously on these hours of the Passion, co-redeems mankind with Christ. Earlier I said only God can redeem mankind from its sin, and that's true. St. Paul says this to Timothy in the New Testament. There is one mediator between God and man. Jesus Christ. There's no other mediator. Jesus is the sole mediator who redeems mankind from its slavery to sin. However, we can cooperate with Jesus' work of redemption. Here the soul, by meditating on the hours, co-redeems with Christ. And let me read this excerpt to you. From volume 11, November 6, 1914. Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, know that by doing these hours the soul takes my thoughts and makes them its own. It takes my reparations, prayers, desires, affections, and even the most intimate fibers of my heart and makes them its own. And rising up between heaven and earth, it carries out my own office as co-redeemer, it says with me, Ecce ego miti me. Here I am, send me, another Latin expression. I want to make reparation for all, to answer for all, and to beseech blessings for all, unquote. So here the soul, by meditating on these hours, co-redeems with Christ in an eternal dimension between heaven and earth that embraces all creatures of the past, present, and future. And this is the power of these hours of the Passion. The meditation on the hours of the Passion is predicated upon the cross. There is no Passion without a cross. Now the word Passion, I know in the vulgar sense of the word, may mean many things. It may mean desire, it may mean affection, it may mean love, it may mean, it may, may mean suffering, sorrow, 
sorrowful experiences and so forth. But in the writings of Louisa, the word passion in relation to Jesus is always intimately united with the cross. That is redemptive suffering and sorrows. The difference between suffering and sorrow or pain and sorrow is that sorrow is interior and the others, pain and suffering, are exterior at least in the writings of Louisa. Sometimes she confounds the two, but by and large, sorrows are interior and they're more valuable than the pains and external sufferings that were inflicted upon our Lord by the centurions. Now, in the fiat of redemption, which Jesus accomplished on earth, Jesus reordered man's interior by forming within his humanity the life of his passion. In his redemptive passion, Jesus assumed all human acts in order to make reparation and offer satisfaction for them to the Father, as well as to sanctify them. Indeed, Jesus formed the life of his passion in Louisa in order to train her how to live in his most holy will. Now, to further elaborate upon that idea of interior sorrows, external pains, consider the following uh, excerpt from volume 11, March 8th, 1912. Jesus here reveals to Louisa, everything that man does externally is nothing but the outpouring of his interior. If so much evil shows on the outside, what must the interior be like? This is why the redoing of man's interior cost me very much. It is enough to say that it took me as long as thirty years. My thoughts, my heartbeats, my breaths, and my desires were always intent on keeping a pace with every one of man's thoughts, heartbeats, breaths, and desires to make reparation, to offer satisfaction, and to sanctify them." Unquote. Now Jesus formed the life of his passion in Louisa for the purpose of mediating mercy to mankind and satisfying the divine justice on behalf of mankind. And he also does so with the soul who meditates on the hours of the passion. Okay. Jesus, sometimes, while Louisa was meditating on the hours of the Passion he dictated to her, would place her in the center of his humanity. Remember I explained at the beginning what humanity is, what Jesus' humanity is, not just his body but also his soul, his human soul. He would place her in the center of his humanity, where for a time he would renew in her his stigmatic soul, his salvific pains. Consider the following excerpt taken from volume 18, October 1st, 1925. One who lives in my will abides in the center of my humanity because the divine will abides in me as the sunlight within the sun. Although its rays envelop the earth, it never departs from its place on high, from its own center. It remains always enclosed within its sphere, on its majestic throne. Such is my divine will within me, which as the center within the sphere of my humanity generates light that envelops everyone and every place. He also tells Louisa in volume 12, taken from March 14th, 1919, in response to the following remark of Louisa. So let me first read Louisa's appeal to Jesus and his response to her. Louisa relates, in obedience to my greatest shame and repugnance, I will say the thing which I had neglected to say and write. 
I remember that one day my sweet Jesus said to me, My daughter, since I have chosen you as the first one to live in my will, every time you enter my will you will find the pains that the divinity gave me. Not those that souls had given me and that were also embraced by my eternal will, because those pains were finite. Indeed, I want you in my will where you will find infinite and innumerable pains. You will have countless nails, multiple crowns of thorns, repeated deaths, and interminable pains all similar to mine. They will be divine and immense and will extend in an infinite way to every one of the past, present, and future. You will be the first one to be united with me as the little lamb slaughtered by the hands of my father, only to rise again. And he continues on like this. Aren't you happy? he says to her. And Louisa replies, Jesus, Jesus, I feel too unworthy and believe you are making a huge mistake in choosing me. A poor little nobody. Please be mindful of what you are doing. And Jesus, interrupting me, added, why are you afraid? Yes, yes, I have been mindful for the thirty-two years of your confinement to bed, where I have kept you. I exposed you to many trials and even to death. I calculated everything. And so, if I am wrong, it will be a mistake of your Jesus which cannot harm you, but will only bring you immense blessings. But know that I will have the honor and the glory of the first stigmatic soul in my will conceived in sin. So Louisa was the first soul to experience these timeless pa passion, passions of Jesus, that is, these crosses he imposed upon her with her free consent. But Mary also was the first creature conceived without sin. But Louisa was the first conceived in sin. Now, the reason why these, were, these pains, he tells her, were different from the other pains that he also embraced on earth, which were the... Um, let me go back here and reread this point so I, I, I relate to you exactly what I wish to. He tells her, you will feel these pains. Um, was this? Oh, here we go. Back to this passage. He relates to her, you will have countless nails, multiple crowns of thorns, repeated deaths, and interminable pains all similar to mine. Not those that souls had given me and that were also embraced by my eternal will because these creaturely pains were finite. Okay, what is the difference between these two pains? The pains that were finite, that Jesus also embraced, were those of committed by souls of his lifetime only. Those pains that were infinite were souls, or sorry, were pains committed by souls of all generations that no other creature was able to embrace before the gift of living in the divine world was given because the soul's propensity to transcend time and space was not yet actualized. It was actualized for the first time in Louisa, that is, for the first time in a soul conceived in sin. So while all the saints of the past were able to offer reparation to God for sins of others, no saint of the past before Louisa was able to offer reparation for all sins of all generations. This is new. And this is what we are drawn in to do when we live in the divine will. Now, some people are afraid of suffering, and rightly so. No one, the body does not like to suffer, does not like pain, and we have no control over the body's desires when it comes to its emotions, its affections, or we have very little control over these. But what we do have complete mastery over is our will, our intellect. Okay, well, um, the intellect to some extent, but the will, yes. The intellect, the memory, 
to some extent, because Satan can put thoughts in the intellect without our consent, images, um, ideas, and we don't have we don't consent to these always. But the will is completely under our control. So the will is the greatest faculty of the human nature. The heart, the breath, the blood, the intellect, the memory, and the will of these, the will is the greatest. Because the will is able to, with God's will, empowering the human will, transcend time and space now, which was not possible before Louisa. The human will's propensity to transcend time and space was never reactualized from the time of Adam and Eve's original sin to Louisa, apart from Jesus and Mary, who knew no sin. But once Louisa's propensity, once the propensity of her will was endowed with the same propensity Adam and Eve enjoyed before sin, that is to transcend time and space, well, anyone conceived in sin can also transcend time and space with their will and offer reparation to God for all sins of all time. This is new. And this is what is meant when it comes to um, embracing the pains, the sorrows of all centuries. So while some people are afraid of suffering or are displeased with suffering or pains of the body, that's okay because the sufferings he's talking to Louisa about are primarily sufferings that are interior of the will. Now, what are these sufferings of the will? Well, as articulated, he shares with us what they are. Of course, he uses symbols. He speaks spiritually, symbolically oftentimes. For example, in the previous passage of Via Felix Culpa, He said he endowed human nature with the diamonds and the pearls. That means his own interior sorrows. In God's eyes, these are diamonds, these are pearls, because they save souls from hell. Now, when he speaks to Louisa about her stigmatic soul and the sufferings that he called her to embrace, he talks to her about undergoing innumerable deaths. If I recall, he speaks to her about the crown, the thorns that she will be embracing. These are spiritual. These don't necessarily mean physical thorns, of course, placed upon her head. And he speaks to her about um, repeated deaths, interminable pains, similar to his. These are primarily interior. Yes, they are also sometimes exterior. So we will in life sometimes experience some illness, maybe, or some pain, stub our toe, cut our hand, bang our arm, whatever it is. But most of these are interior, meaning rejection, persecution, um, false witness, um, um, consternation, vexation, oppression, and things like that. Even our loved ones, you know, treating us improperly. These are the things that we offer up to God, you see. We convert them with our free will, or rather, with God's divine will operating on our will. We convert them into pearls and diamonds so that they can be now a coin of incalculable value to purchase souls for heaven, to purchase their redemption, to purchase their freedom. Yes, Jesus redeemed them, but we help ensure that redemption as co-redeemers with Christ. And we help facilitate their sanctification. All right? So while Christ redeemed in his humanity on earth all human beings, not all human beings will be saved. Why? Due to no fault of Christ's redemption, he gave everyone the grace to be redeemed, to be saved. The word redemption is different from salvation. Okay? Christ redeemed everyone. That means he gave us all the grace necessary whereby we may be saved with our free consent to God's grace. However, we can reject that treasure trove of grace Christ purchased for us with his redemption. We can turn our back to Christ even after we're baptized. And some people do, of course. 
This is where we come in, you see. We help in the work of redemption. We don't redo Christ's work, no. It doesn't need to be redone. Rather, we are carrying out in our humanity, in time and space, that which Christ already did in his humanity. Christ gave everyone enough grace to be holy, to live a holy life. And when they live a holy life, they're doing nothing other than carrying out what Christ had presented for them, for them to embrace and live, okay? So that's what we do in the work of redemption. We are actualizing that which is in potency, that which Christ prepared for us, sort of like a father gives a son or a daughter a new car or a new um, house. The house is waiting for the daughter, the car is waiting for the son to be occupied, to be driven. But until the ignition switch is turned and the foot is placed upon the pedal, until the key knob, the, the key turns the knob of the door and the daughter enters the house, the experience is not made or is not um, fulfilled. Similarly, we have to actualize what is in potency. So we're turning that ignition creek. We are turning the knob of that door when we are offering our interior sorrows to God for the salvation of soul, so to speak. In this sense, Jesus called Louisa to become a victim. The grace of victimhood is what she was called to embrace. He would alternate his divine sufferings with those of Louisa to expiate and to make reparation for the sins of mankind. Jesus refers to this participation of our human nature, of Louisa's human nature, in his divine sufferings, in the sufferings of his passion, as a baptism of victimhood. He tells Louisa in volume 11 on March 13, 1912, My daughter, baptism at birth is by water. That is why it has the virtue of purifying, but not of removing tendencies and passions. On the other hand, the baptism of victimhood is a baptism by fire. Therefore, it has not only the virtue of purifying, but of consuming any evil tendency and passion that may exist. What is more, I myself baptize the soul little by little. My thought baptizes the thoughts of the soul. My heartbeat baptizes its heartbeats. My desire, its desires, and so on. However, this baptism is carried out between me and the soul, according to whether it gives itself to me without ever reneging its offer. This is why, my daughter, you do not feel evil tendencies and the like. It comes from your state of victimhood, and I tell you this for your consolation. Unquote. So this is really the essence of victimhood. It's not slavery. It's not being a tool or sport of the devil, God allowing you to be the butt of other people's satire or callous jokes. No. The concept of victimhood or baptism of the cross or baptism of victimhood that he calls Louisa to and us to participate in is really nothing other than the simple daily living out of our inconveniences, troubles, and issues that we face in life and that God permits us to face so that we can convert them for the salvation of souls by embracing them. Even if they're unjust, we do not have to... Um, we do not have to agree with an injustice imposed upon us, but by virtue of the salvific value of our pains offered or sorrows offered up to God, we can accept them. There's a beautiful prayer you're familiar with, the serenity prayer. God grant me the things, grant me, if I can remember it correctly, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, Courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. It's a very beautiful prayer. And this is underlying the idea of accepting what we cannot change 
even if it's an injustice, and offering that up for the salvation of souls. One of the things in Christianity that is grossly underrated is intentionality. What can make a saint and a sinner great or bad is intentionality. That's it. They can both do the same action, which could be with or without value, depending upon their intentionality. So if I do something, let's say that's externally good, but the intention is to seek the applause of others, not to give glory to God. I could be a great singer, a great artist, and I do these things not to give God glory or to help others in any way, but just to promote myself, to make money, and to seek fame and fortune. There's no value in that at all before God, because the intention makes it meritless. If, however, what I do with my talents is to give God glory and to help others, God, who sees that noble, altruistic intention, will reward it accordingly, and that makes it meritorious. So, when we offer up something that is thrust upon us, that is unjust, even if we cannot, um, we do not agree with it, but we offer it up to God, we do not agree with it, but we accept it, then it becomes salvific, it becomes redemptive, because God sees our good intentions and rewards them accordingly. All right. Continue, please, to support this program of Radio Maria and the network worldwide, because it continues to strengthen us in our resolve in these sad times in which we live, to desire and live in God's grace and through His grace in His will, by serving each other, by helping each other, by informing ourselves of the will of God in order to do, in order to do it. May God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This confusion in the Church today is precipitated by opportunists, people that take advantage. Paul alluded to this when he spoke of an apostasia in Greek, which is really a rebellion on the part of the masses against the church. We're living in those times today. And this provides an opportunity for opportunist promoters of false messages, apocalyptic messages, blogs, websites. Some of them are well-intentioned, I'm sure. But others are less well-intentioned. Some will use this as an opportunity on which to make a killing monetarily. You know, there's an old saying in the media business, if it bleeds, it leads. These Catholic websites have followed suit. Whatever is the most violent and gory is getting the most attention. There are many lay promoters claiming to be experts and refusing guidance from authorities within the mystical theology space. They avail themselves of the vulnerability and the naivete of the faithful who are looking for this spirit of leadership. Now, Enter the opportunists, a.k.a. false promoters of false apocalyptic messages. And these people feed off of the naivete and the vulnerability of the little ones of whom our Lord spoke in Matthew 18. Woe to those of you who mislead these little ones. Better for a millstone to be tied around his neck and thrown into the lake.